and welcome to everyone for joining us this morning. It's nice to see at least some of your names, uh, if not your, your pictures this morning. Um, we're really pleased that uh, Representative Jonathan Christ Thompson, or JKT as he is finally, uh, oh, what did I said it wrong. Um, um, JKT as he's more finally, um, uh, uh, known as, uh, for joining us this morning. And we really appreciate the work he did as part of the legislature's uh, working group uh, over the last couple of months. And so we've invited him to talk with us about um, um, their work, as well as hopefully get an update as to what's going on this week um, while they're in special session. Also, I had an opportunity this week to talk with Senator Hughes, who also participated in the um, uh, working group, and she may join us as well. She has a funeral that she was trying to balance um, um, this morning, um, her time, but uh, hopefully she'll be able to also give us some insights on the Senate side. So Cheryl, I am online, just so you oh, know. Oh, great. Oh, great. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Appreciate it. So with that, we'll turn it over to JKT um, to kick off. And uh, Senator Hughes, you're welcome to uh, chime in as, as you'd like to. And I'll turn it over to Juanetta because she's really our officiator um, um, for all things Zoom. So um, with that, let me go back to Juanetta and then she can launch from there. Okay. So thank you. Great to see everybody this morning. Thanks, Cheryl. I'm going to bring uh, JKT in, Representative Christ Tompkins, you're on screen, and um, the floor is yours. Hi, Juanita. Um, how, how would you, uh, what would be the best use of time, or where should I start, or in um, terms of framing did things? You want to do a, did you want to do a slide deck this morning? No, I didn't prepare one. Okay, all right. So um, the floor is yours. Um, generally, uh, speakers uh, speak for, um, you know, up to 20 minutes, and uh, then we'll do some audience Q&A. And uh, again, if, if uh, Senator Hughes wants to join on camera or add some comments, we can make time for um, that as well. I, I just want to say at 830, I'm going to have to get off. So you might want to flip the order. Um, oh, okay. It's up to you. Okay. Um, uh, I'll, I'll be able to listen in for a little while after 830, but um, I wouldn't be able to speak after that. Okay. All right. Um, I'm getting a report of an echo. Um, some folks are reporting an echo. Is anybody else having an echo problem? Okay. All right. So we're gonna we're gonna flip the order and we're gonna ask Senator Hughes to uh, to step in and uh, we'll come back to JKT. So Senator Hughes. Well, good morning, everyone, and thank you uh, for for inviting us. It has been quite a ride the last six years, and I think that is part of what. Uh, motivated the eight of us on the fiscal plan working group to collaborate um, because it has been frustrating uh, to be wrapped around the axle on the PFD, frankly, and neglect some other things important to this state that we need to focus on. And I'll just give two quick examples. Education, we came out again in a recent study as uh, I believe 49th and, um, you know, uh, Senator Begish and I have been working on the Read by Nine bill for five years now, and we can't seem to get across the finish line because toward the end of each session, we become so obsessed with dealing with PFD that nothing else of uh, real importance seems to get through. So that's one example. Another one uh, example that um, I've wanted to work on the last couple of years is human sex trafficking, which we don't think is a problem in Alaska, but it actually is and it needs to be addressed. So that's just two examples. I'm sure Jonathan could come up with additional ones. And so as we came together as a group, um, it was, it was um, a very interesting time, but also I feel uh, it was rewarding also because we came from the most diverse districts as far as across the political spectrum and we worked through things. The first couple of weeks we focused on agreeing on fiscal assumptions. There was some disagreement between the executive branch and the legislative branch on certain uh, assumptions, such as, as you do modeling what inflation rate, for example, should be used. 
And then we, we came together on a, a list of principles upon which we agreed. And then we started getting into the nitty gritty and um, had some very good exercises. So you'll notice public, uh, as far as public hearings, um, we, we weren't meeting you know, nonstop, but we were pretty much meeting nonstop many times. Uh, I believe there was one week where we actually had nine meetings. So we were often meeting on Saturdays and Sundays, um, usually two hour Zoom meetings at a time. And then there'd be communications. Jonathan and I would have um, uh, phone calls, you know, uh, as back and forth between individuals and groups and text chats. So um, probably all in all a couple hundred hours or close to it for some of us. And then, then we were individually doing research and coming up with things. And, one of the things I spent a fair amount of time, you know, as a fiscal conservative, I was, um, I've been frustrated that we haven't been able to make more reductions than we have. And yet on the, uh, the left of center, they were a little concerned um, about making reductions because they didn't want to jeopardize state services. So we did an exercise of trying to come up with suggested reductions that would not reduce state services. And um, although we didn't list some of those particulars as far as reductions and revenues, we had very robust and thorough discussions. We did not have the luxury of being able to hold a hearing such as a finance committee where you could bring in multiple experts. So there was hesitancy to actually list all, all these particulars because we were not able to fully vet them, but we did come up with lists that we felt were worth exploring. And part of it was also to help us realize that we could reach our targets as far as reductions and, and uh, revenues. And um, yeah, and then as far as the PFD, I know there's a variety of opinions on what that split would be, but one of the things we had, we had to realize that this was a give and take process. We had to build consensus on those items that we had agreement. And then for the points of differences, we had to figure out how to accommodate those and, um, and I felt like we were successful getting to that point. At one of the, a couple of the principles that we had was that we had to bear in mind the voting thresholds of 11 and 21 for policy bills, 14, 20, and 27 for um, any constitutional amendment, but also uh, how, would it, how would the public respond at the ballot box? We were also aware um, of, of, you know, things needed to be passed through the, the governor's desk as well. And although some of the members preferred an income tax, for instance, over sales tax, the governor did communicate to us um, that he would veto an income tax. So um, I will say our revenue list, we, we um, discussed all the ones that Commissioner Mahoney presented to us the one, and, and Jonathan can certainly add to this, but the one that seemed to get the least reception was the gaming gambling um, proposal. Um, but the others, there was um, quite a bit of consideration that they had a potential. So um, I, I, would you like to have us answer questions? Because I, I could keep chatting, but I'm there may be something that someone is particularly interested in, and I'd be happy to um, take a question or two or three. Um, we'll ask the audience to uh, go ahead and submit their questions via chat and uh, we'll, we can come back to those uh, as time allows. But uh, I'll go ahead and bring um, Representative Chris Tompkins back on camera and, and he can offer any remarks. Um, thanks, Juanita. Um, yeah, I, Shelley's uh, yeah, Shelley's comments are good sort of framing. I, I guess I could sort of speak to the, the process, um, although I'll, I'll maybe work from an assumption that most people have seen the final report. Um, but there's basically a three-phase process. The first phase was um, creating a common definition of the problem, which uh, took probably the better part of two weeks, <laughs> just that. Um, which is locking in on consensus fiscal assumptions, um, you know, some of which required a little bit of give and take and compromise because they were just on the exercise of assumptions and baselines. Um, there's not necessarily, 
unanimous outlook. Um, but fortunately, we were able to get to a common set of assumptions for the purposes of um, sort of proceeding through the work group process. The second phase was identifying sort of on a conceptual or, or higher altitude level what pieces we thought would be um, definitely mathematically necessary, but also politically necessary for a comprehensive solution that could get 21 votes and 11 votes in the House and the Senate for the statutory pieces and 27 and 14 for any constitutional pieces. And, and then the final, final uh, phase of the work was um, converting some of those conceptual pieces to more specific components, even if there were sort of ranges or multiple options that reflected the breadth of outlook or perspective within the working group. So for instance, sales tax versus income tax, um, uh, like was a point that was say not resolved, although there was a perspective that a broad-based tax um, uh, would have utility. Uh, another example is um, for a transition period, um, a PFD stair-step approach versus a ERA um, uh, sort of one-time overdraw and bridge. So those are examples of where there were sort of different schools of thought um, that are encompassed in the final report, but we're sort of trying to get as specific as possible and sort of narrow or collapse the complexity as much as possible to sort of give, um, which uh, forgive the corny metaphor, but sort of a strike zone for where a solution could exist. And of course, a comprehensive solution could exist outside that strike zone. Um, this was just sort of our uh, effort to try to make a good faith attempt to identify where a comprehensive solution could be or what the what the framework at least somewhat generally um could look like so that was the three-phase process which is maybe helpful for context great uh, i'll bring uh, senator hughes back and uh, we'll uh, again, ask the audience to submit any questions online in chat. Um, uh, I'm going to uh, ask Cheryl to step in. Cheryl, do you have any questions that you'd like to start off with? Sure. Thanks, Juan. And thank you to both of you for your work that you've done over the last couple of months, as well as the, the number of years, too, on these issues. Um, so what's the traction in the legislature now that you've come back into special session uh, for the committee's report? Um, you know, we see what we read in the newspaper, but what are we not reading in the newspaper in terms of um, uh, progress on, on taking action on a comprehensive plan, um, as well as the individual pieces getting introduced? I'll go first if that's okay. And thank you for mentioning comprehensive because that was kind of a principle that the package that we put forward was to be taken as a whole and we weren't promoting one piece individually, but it, it needs to be all the pieces together. And um, I, I decided I was gonna cut my colleagues, the other um, 52, well, really 48, because we did have alternates um, to give them time to process because they didn't go through the exercise that we did for five or six weeks with the back and forth and um, resolving the differences. So they needed a little time to process. I, I don't know what in where Jonathan thinks we are, but I would say that um, the vast majority of the legislature, it wants to tackle this and wants to solve it. One of the things that wherever anyone is on the spectrum, it's very clear that the public is frustrated and we have a trust and credibility problem because of how we've been handling things in recent years. And no matter where a person is on the political spectrum, if you're serving in the legislature, you don't like that. And we would like to regain that trust and settling this is going to be um, important to do that. And what I've seen in, in the week, it, it, you know, that people are starting to come around. You'll notice the governor added an appropriation bill to the call. Well, I think he, yeah, he did yesterday, I believe so, yes. And part of that was, um, that was important to some people to, um, as part of the complete package, actually, even though it pertains particularly to FY23, 
22, it still it can be pivotal to move forward on this long-term fiscal plan. So um, I, I, I feel like that was a positive step. Uh, want some of the ones that are a, a bit hesitant and maybe aren't embracing this quite as much, they do have pivotal chairmanships. Uh, so, you know, one of the things I had a couple people frustrated that the Senate had a technical floor session and I believe the House maybe canceled their floor sessions. And I said, well, don't be watching for the floor sessions to this point. What we need to be looking for is what is getting scheduled in committees, because there's not going to be anything ready to come to the floor for a vote until things have been vetted through the committee. So that's that's what we're hoping will occur. Um, and, you know, I, I am uh, the glasses half full kind of person, so I am optimistic. I, I'm, it's not a done deal. It's it's a big lift. And I hope, I, I believe we've already succeeded in one thing. We've started the conversation. And um, I, I think that if we can get at least some things moving during this 30 days, I will be pleased. I'd love for one or two things at least to get to the floor and be passed. One of the things we're looking at is what can you put under the umbrella in, uh, uh, with a single subject rule, what all can be in one bill. Because when you're trying to move um, different components through, people are hesitant to vote on one thing when they're not sure if something else is going to pass. So um, we probably will be combining components to the extent that that is allowable, allowable legally. Representative Chris Tompkins, did you want to add anything to that? Yeah, I, my, my impression, um, I mean, I've just had one-off conversations with a handful of other legislators, but nothing overly systematic. Um, well, I guess there was a conversation yesterday that was was s somewhat broad. Um, but um, uh, I mean, this week, I think has mostly been characterized about, uh, at least from my vantage in the House, questions about short term fiscal pieces and the appropriations bill and the reverse sweep in the PFD this year. And so um, I'm not sure there's sort of been a, um, a fully focused sort of conversation on, okay, you know, comprehensive solution, do we want to do this? If so, how do we want to do this? Um, and, you know, thoughts and reflections on what the working group or really sort of any other proposal out there might look like in terms of receptivity or rejection, traction or not traction. Um, so now that the approach bill is out, um, I would like to hope at least that there will be um, sort of a shift in attention and consideration um, uh, really starting today, I guess, because um, the bills will get referred out and um, we'll sort of go from there and committee work will begin. Okay. Um, you know, uh, of course, no, none of this is happening in a vacuum, and uh, we've had a recent court ruling with regard to the PCE, uh, and of course, then the governor um, adding to the uh, the call for this this special session. Um, are are those uh, processes informing what you think the solution may be moving forward? We can start with JKT and then go to Senator Hughes. In, in one edit, just once more on the question whether um, the sweep, reverse sweep, and decisions about what's caught up in that, whether that's sort of affecting or adding flavor to the session? Yes. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, for yes, uh, at least for some, and uh, in, in, a, in a big way. I mean, I think that's one of the short term issues that um, uh, at least, you know, in certain circles in the legislature, great concern. And um, uh, I mean, from my personal perspective, I, I, I wish the sweep was never a factor and that we weren't spending time talking about what's sweeped and what's not and the sweep was reversed. And I say that as someone who spent four years in the minority who never even thought of the sweep as something that you would not vote to do or vote to reverse um, would be more accurately stated. Um, uh, but now that, I mean, now that there's the court ruling and now that there's, I think the potential of reversing it, 
Um, I mean, that's a relief to me, at least. The, uh, I mean, narrowly on PCE, that's a relief to my district, which has many PCE communities. Um, and I, you know, the court ruling is just for one piece of, of um, a, a program or a fund that would be caught up in the suite potentially depending on legal interpretation. So there's still other stuff out there, but hopefully just, you know, can get that whole thing taken care of um, and sort of remove that from, from the, the radar screen so we can focus on the other bigger, bigger items. But at least that's my, that, that's my perspective on, on the issue. Okay, Senator? Yes, thank you for the question. Um, it's it's no secret. Um, I think everyone is engaged that's on this call that would understand that when um, the court ruling came down regarding PCE, that removed leverage that the House Minority Republicans had. And um, at the same time, there is still concern that PCE at any point could be used for anything with a simple majority vote. So there are still those that are concerned and want protection for the PCE just for the use of the funds sake. And one of the conversations that um, I've had with some just while we're talking about PCE, it, if you recall, that fund was set up um, to counter the uh, tons of money going into the rail, but rail belt infrastructure so that we could have um, more affordable energy along the rail belt. And one of the things with PCE, we've been, well, we have been using it to subsidize monthly payments for households, but um, many folks um, from across the spectrum would like to see at least part of it um, converted to the same purpose that the money on the rail belt was used. And that is actually for infrastructure off the rail belt to lower their energy costs. So to get them off of diesel, diesel for instance, so that the, that the need to subsidize their monthly bills wouldn't be necessary. So um, there is some discussion of that. There's so much innovation as far as alternative energy and other options um, that can power a low, uh, a low population that it, it is something that some of those, we'd like to see some of those PCE funds come to that. So yes, it did remove some leverage. Um, it's still important. And you're all aware the WAMI programs, uh, scholarship program, there's still things out there that are um, kind of hanging hanging there uh, without funds. So those still have to be resolved. And, and my conversations with the governor, and he's had it with a number of others, he's very willing um, to work on those things. And um, I believe he would, you know, if we can get a, a package through, he's happy to, if some of those things are reinserted in an appropriation bill, he would agree not to revote, to re veto them in order to get a package through and um, solve this um, crazy merry-go-round ride that we have been on for six years. Thank you. You know, one of the questions that has come up uh, quite a bit in the last year is, is uh, what sources of information do legislators rely on in terms of reaching their conclusions about some of these topics? And a, a, a companion to that is what do you believe the public believes? Um, Gunnar Knapp is on with us and he's asking the question, to what extent do you believe the public understands or believes that the solution must be comprehensive? Uh, without dealing with, you know, the other part that that it, it's possible to divide the question or bifurcate the question with regard to um, sources of funding uses and what the dividend may be. May I go first on that one because sure, I'm sure. getting down to the wire. Mm -hmm. I think um, there there's a spectrum of how much people are aware of the total problem. I can when people just weigh in regarding the PFD. I always wonder whether they understand the full problem. And I know in my district, I started talking about the point at which low oil production would intersect with low oil prices and we'd hit this gap point. And I started doing that about eight years ago and have talked about you know, how we were gonna hit this and we would have to look at you know, some combination of re reductions and revenues. So I feel like the, the people that are engaged in my district seem to understand it, but I know a lot of Alaskans 
um, don't fully comprehend, but I think they're they're coming on board. When you have when you have people, e even this, and I, I wish it were out in the news just a little bit better, not because of us or anything, but just to demonstrate here you have people that are um, left of center to very left of center to right of center to very right of center agreeing that we need to use multiple levers to solve this. And I think um, it, it helps when someone like me, who's so conservative is saying that, it's um, helping people that normally would just be totally opposed to some of these components. It, it's making them stop and think. I spoke to a group last night and um, they're pretty much an anti-tax group, for instance, and they seem to understood we've hit this point. It's gonna take us a few years to get through it. And this is what we've got to do. We have a constitutional obligation to pass a funded budget. We don't have the luxury of Congress. We, we can't rack up debt. We can't print money. We have, when there's a gap, and if you don't have the votes to make the reductions, then you have to look at revenues. And that's where we are. Representative Christ Tompkins. Yeah, I, I mean, I would I agree with Shelley in that I, I mean, hopefully, the there, I mean, there are a lot of unanimous recommendations that these are, you know, components as a part of, of an integrated comprehensive solution that will probably be necessary. And um, I mean, I think it's worth saying, like, we could be wrong, like, there's, there's no, there's no presumption of, of um, authority, it was just like, you know, it was a good faith effort by the eight of us to try to get us like, this is a very tough problem. And so is this was like our sort of best foot forward with a lot of thought and diligence and, and work. Um, I think like for me, uh, like another sort of sign of success would be, you know, okay, if not this, then, then what? And, you know, as sort of other proposals, ideas, anything that like sort of breaks the log jam or ice dam or whatever you want to call it in terms of um, offer and counter offer and proposal and counter proposal and a sort of um, vernacular of, of like policy discussion that I, I think has been relatively absent and, and relatively smothered by um, politics, not that politics still don't exist or anything. Um, so um, yeah, I, I, I would agree. Um, yeah, agree with Shelley's comments that, you know, very diverse perspectives. I, I we talked about this in, internal in the group, but, um, you know, I, I like, I did a quick analysis of all of Alaska's 40 legislative districts and how they voted for president in 2020. And our work group includes literally the most conservative district <laughs> in the legislature, which is representative of McCabe's district. And it also includes literally the most liberal district in Alaska, which is downtown Juneau, which is half of Senator Keel's district. And so, there's a lot of breadth, was a lot of breadth, is a lot of breadth in the work group. And um, and um, I mean, I think it's it's helpful that sort of people can get out of their individual ideological lanes and sort of like zoom out and see the whole of Alaska and say like, okay, you know, for if we want to solve this, like, you know, outside of my district in Big Lake or my district in downtown Juneau, I think, like these are some of the gifts and these are some of the gets that might get us there for the whole of the 40 districts in Alaska, for all of Alaska and, and the sort of diversity that exists within there. Um, and, and that was helpful. And, and to like, to be totally frank, I, I, I think in the first couple of weeks, we probably weren't there as sort of a group paradigm as we were getting to know each other, as we were sort of building trust, as we were sort of getting a sense of what that all felt like, but sort of through time and, and, um, and in, in, in getting the, a lot of conversation on the different pieces and sort of where different people were and developing sort of uh, a sense of, of like the spectrum of opinion out there. Um, I, I think that sort of came came in in, in due time over the, the subsequent weeks after the, the start of the process. Can I interrupt? Because I'm, I'm gonna sign off. I'm gonna call in and I'll have muted while I'm driving. Um, but I just wanted to, to thank Commonwealth North for having us. Um, I provided to Juanita my cell phone if anyone wants to follow up with discussion. Um, but I, I just want to thank you all. I know this has been a focus of yours for a number of years. 
and it would be great to get something across the finish line and have uh, long-term fiscal certainty uh, for a lot of reasons, for business sake, um, for even stability of, of the state and of families and households. So thank you so much for your work and um, let's keep the dialogue going. Thank you. Great, thank you so much. All right, uh, well, uh, the spotlight's on you now. <laughs> and uh, a follow-up question it would be that, um, and this is a follow-up from Gunnar, um, how contentious of a question was it in the planning group's process um, in, in terms of agreeing on uh, and having confidence in the information and modeling that you had about uh, our circumstances and uh, what, what they may, might look like moving forward and any uh, assumptions, particularly with regard to potential future fiscal stressors that might impact those assumptions. Uh, how, how, we're, how, how willing were um, the work group members to trust in that? And does that trust extend to your colleagues throughout the legislature? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. And um, we, we spent, I, I would guess at least 10 hours of group time on those specific questions. Um, I should also add that Alexi from Legislative Finance and um, I mean, it was like very much intentional to have conversation and process grounded in ob objective and mathematical reality wherever possible. And also, I mean, just the like voluminous expertise that legislative finance brings to the table. So instead of, you know, the eight of us just like riffing opinions off each other that whenever possible, we ground in just like policy and budget and fiscal fact. And so it was a, it was a, I, I guess it's just worth noting that the process was um, very much grounded by that. And so w working to the question from Gunnar, in, in terms of assumptions and uh, countenancing the possibility of fiscal stress, that was, um, strongly considered. So, I mean, one of the unanimous recommendations is whatever plan that's produced, um, like needs to be resilient to fiscal stress. And um, we did a lot of like live modeling on Zoom, all of us in legislative finance running through different sort of black swan or other sort of fiscal doomsday scenarios. Um, we, I, it's not in the report, but we sort of identified unanimously what measures of stress test that we were most interested in. Um, I could go through my notes and pull them up. It just seemed a little bit sort of overly nitty gritty um, to include in the report, but they were like uh, <laughs> pretty <laughs> severe stress tests. So, um, and, and, you know, we all felt basically like what the, the numbers have to work even in the face of fiscal stress and the plan has to be resilient to those tests. Um, so that's really, really important. And, and that, of course, tethers closely per Gunnar's question to fiscal assumptions. And um, I think, you know, in particular, fiscal assumptions around inflation, fiscal assumptions around POMB earnings and 6.2% from Callen, um, mm -hmm. and fiscal assumptions around oil uh, production and price forecast from DOR were all really operative. And I mean, frankly, like the, <laughs> some of our thinking and conversation is already a little bit dated. I mean, with the Willow decision um, earlier this week, that has implications. Although Alexia has pointed actually those fiscal implications are really actually more than a decade out for reasons that some of you probably already know, and I could get into if that's helpful, but, um, but um, you know, I, I, uh, the, the short of it is, a lot of thought and a lot of conversation. I think, and I, I think, I think part of the question was also, you know, was there unanimity or diverse perspectives? Ultimately, I think we got to unanimous recommendation. I don't think this is talking out of school, or I, I hope this is fair and reflective of, of group conversation. But at the get go, I think there was more um, different. Different members put different weight on how important or unimportant that was. Um, 
uh, but we were able to work to sort of a unanimous um, position and recommendation on the importance of resilience to fiscal stress being a, uh, a principle of any comprehensive solution. Hmm. Okay. Um, uh, Ralph Townsend's online with us, and, and he asks a question about uh, how capital spending is managed within the, the, the modeling or the budget numbers that the work group agreed to. And does whatever that um, process looks like, uh, does it assume moving to general obligation bonding for capital projects? Um, and and I would add to that, uh, and then how is that factored into um, demand for UGF for future uh, debt service for those bonded projects? Um, it, it does not assume bonding for capital budgets. Um, so the, the fiscal assumption we locked in on, um, and, and just for, for group reference in the link that you kindly sent out, one Netta, um, in the um, assumptions process piece, and then there's a, another hyperlink within this PDF that links to uh, all the fiscal assumptions, um, if anybody is, wants to get really nerdy about it. Um, but the fiscal assumption for the capital budget was $150 million for federal match plus additional $60 million, um, which sort of rule of thumb from group conversation and, and dialogue with legislative finance seemed like a sort of minimum but also reasonable amount for a capital budget. So that's $210 million collectively of, of direct spend, not not borrowing and not bonding um, per year, and then growing, of course, at that 2% inflation assumption that was also identified. Um, uh, you know, it's worth noting federal transportation bill maybe throws a curveball, but again, th those are there's only you know so much detail that you want to encompass in scope. Um, and um, I mean, I know there's a lot of talk about bonding. The governor and DOR have talked a lot about bonding. I mean, that is a tool um, that exists. I mean, it's it's effectively a way. It, like in, in the consensus recom or the unanimous recommendation about um, transition measures, one-time transition measures to get you through the first few lean years before revenue starts to kind of catch up and, and balancing the budget becomes um, a less daunting task in, in the mid 2020s. Um, uh, if you're borrowing for your capital budgets instead of paying for them, um, that helps you get through that squeeze of those first few fiscal years. So uh, I suppose that is an option and that's, you know, effectively, I think the utility of bonding for capital budgets um, as the governor's proposed. We didn't really talk about it in great depth, but um, I mean, we did talk uh, sort of conceptually or like the, the budget strategy of one time transition measures, which I suppose this would sort of fall into, but um, the direct and simple answer to the question is no, we did not assume bonding for capital budgets. We assumed paying for them with cash at $210 million UGF per year, growing with inflation. Okay. Um, in your report, you talk about the process that individual work group members did their own modeling based on, on then the set of assumptions. And um, Gunner has a follow up. Might it be useful? for those models, those solutions to be made public um, without necessarily attributing them to whatever work group member may have developed them. Yeah, that's an interesting thought. Um, quite possibly. Uh, <laughs> um, I mean, I think Mike Shower has already sort of distributed variations of his model and or maybe presented it to this group last week. Um, yeah, I mean, my, my personal thought is it would be it would be a very productive exercise if every member of the legislature sort of went through that exercise, because I'm I'm very confident, um, you know, only only a subset have, especially members who aren't on the finance committees, which includes myself, by the way, um, because it just it just forces you to work within math, and that's really important ultimately, and um, uh, so yeah, I guess we could do that. I mean, I, I know legislative finance and Alexi have pulled together a deck that kind of synthesizes different models and kind of like gives a sense of like, okay, like option A and B and C and D, um, just to sort of 
frame how legislators might want to sort of consider comprehensive solution options. Mm -hmm. um, but um, yeah, I mean, frankly, I was so consumed with just getting that report out the door by Monday. Um, <laughs> I didn't really think about anything beyond the bare minimum of like, oh my gosh, can this thing get online as a PDF by 2 p.m. on Monday? Um, and I've kind of been um, uh, recovering since then. Yeah. Yeah, understandable. Um, well, I, I, I have to bring you back to, uh, because of that question, I guess, uh, you know, Commonwealth North uh, for a little, well, almost a year and a half has been engaged in uh, a project called the Alaska Budget Choices. And we had nearly 2,200 Alaskans submit their budget solutions. Now, I, I will admit that there were some complexities that you guys dealt with, grappled with, and certainly the one-time measures were something that we did not anticipate in that model. Um, and it, re it really was a, a one-off, one-year solution as opposed to looking long-term. So uh, in some respects, that's why we didn't uh, model for those things. But really, at the end of the day, those 2,200 Alaskans in, in pretty clear voice uh, really came down on uh, holding the line on budget cuts, uh, no new taxes, and moderating the dividend until we can afford to pay more. Um, there's some nuances there. Um, and, and this kind of brings me brings back to that question is like, who do you who do you listen to and what source of information do you find um, efficacious in, in, in making some of these decisions? And, and what role and Cheryl Cheryl Frasca is asking us, what role does the public play going forward as you're considering um, these uh, these choices? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, I think it it ultimately comes down to where each legislator perceives his or her district as, as being on these issues. I mean, I'm in my fifth term. I've voted for um, less than statutory PFDs for, is it four years now? So I've been through two election cycles. Having done that, it's a very clear track record. I haven't, I ran on it, if anything, and ran against people who criticized it. And, um, sort of marketplace of ideas or marketplace of votes. Um, I'm back in the legislature. So, I mean, I, I have like confidence in sort of my own skin and standing in my own shoes and knowing my district sort of um, uh, what I think is at least somewhat representative of, of the folks I represent. And, you know, I know Shelley would this say, say the same of her district and Calvin Shroggy of his district and, um, uh, everybody else of theirs. Um, I mean, it's that's always like being calibrated and tuned and refined by the emails we get every day. And I mean, we went through a public testimony exercise. I, I mean, there's a lot of public testimony that's been taken over the years. I think the the public reaction to the line item vetoes that were proposed in Governor Dunleavy's first year is also highly salient, at least to me, about where the public is and what level of services that they want to see or don't want to see. And you just kind of try to synthesize um, all of that into, into some kind of compass bearing. Um, so it's, it's always being refined. And I think, you know, additional feedback that comes in over the next days and weeks and uh, similarly gets incorporated into that. Um, but there's a large corpus of data point data and data points that at least I feel I have that are really like, you know, over multiple years in terms of where the public's at. And there's like polling, polling data. I mean, there's, you know, all sorts of inputs um, and it's all being incorporated. But I, I and I think it's just like the political reality is like I think each legislator has a strong intuitive sense of where their district is and how they're representing their district. And if they're wrong, they're gonna lose reelection and that's the way the system works. And the system corrects itself because if people vote out of sync with their district, they're gonna, you know, it, the, they won't be back. And that's something, you know, like I'm fully, you know, fully embraced. And I knew that when I voted for smaller PFDs in years past, for instance. 
Um, it's like, I, I feel good. I feel comfortable with this and I could be right. I could be wrong. It turns out I maybe wasn't wrong, but, um, that's, you know, just me and my district and where my comfort level is. Sure. Um, well, I have to, uh, reference, uh, a forum that we had a couple of days ago, uh, Eric McGee with the public policy Institute of California spoke, we asked him to speak about the effects of open primaries and, um, you know, one of the other things that is happening uh, that is not a part of the vacuum is that our electoral processes are going to be substantially different in the next election cycle. And uh, one of the things we were really focused on uh, the, the discussion on open primaries and uh, he shared with us uh, that that maybe it doesn't have the moderating effect that uh, was anticipated in Washington, California, at least. Uh, at least not on the the candidate um, the candidates that run for office. Let's say it may have some individual moderating effect on decisions on individual legislation pieces of legislation. Um, but he said that the one thing that uh, when because of uh, California's history leading up to some of the changes uh, electoral uh, process changes was fighting so significantly over the budget that the population that the uh, was uh, losing faith in the legislature because when when things get to a stalemate when they get to loggerheads there's a feeling that people aren't playing fair that those i think that's a fair characterization of how he he framed it um and he said that one of the things the most uh, important thing that California did was uh, change. They, they had a two thirds vote standard to pass the budget. They changed it to a simple majority. And he said, even though that may give the minority parties uh, less voice in the budget overall, um, that at least a budget could get passed and move forward. And that that there was overall increasing voter satisfaction with the legislature, at least in California. That, that um, so I, I I just wonder if you can reflect a little bit on. Um, I mean, you're all you're all making a bet based on wh where you think your districts are, and and I think you know obviously you're out talking to people. Um, uh, you, you know, you're running for office, you, you have a sense, but uh, there's going to be uh, at least some greater uncertainty uh, going into this next election cycle. Um, and I guess where, what, how, what effect do you think that's having on legislators as you're making these very important decisions? Yeah, yeah, it's a great question. I mean, just so you, everybody can consider the source. I was a strong supporter of ballot measure two and of open primaries and, and final four voting. So wait and calibrate accordingly. Um, I think it's really important. I, and I think probably it's most important on the primary side of the equation, although I think it improves the general election, or at least I hope I do. And I think the bar is not overwhelmingly high, but especially on the primary election side, where I think there's a lot of distortions in the electoral process and what creates representative outcomes. Um, and this is really important. And it, I, I don't, I mean, I think that's been sort of most highlighted on the right side of the aisle, but if you look at other states that are super, super blue, it's very much true on the left side of the aisle too. Um, the, the actual mechanical administration of RCV in New York City was an absolute dumpster fire, but the outcome, I mean, Eric Adams was a center left Democrat who was not a defund the police guy, he was a fund the police guy. I mean, I, I just, there were some candidates, you know, very far to the left. And um, uh, if you had a closed primary system within the Democratic Party for the New York mayoral primary, which for all intents and purposes determines who the next new mayor of New York is, I, arguably there would have been a very different outcome. I, not to say I like support or endorse Eric Adams, but um, I just, you know, it, just to highlight that this is something that you know cuts on both sides. It depends what jurisdiction and the, the sort of political uh, political geography you're in. Um, 
but I, yeah, I just think it's a, a good and important reform. How exactly it'll play out is kind of TBD. It's really worth noting that the top two open primary system in Washington, California is fairly substantively different from, from um, top four and RCV that we have. And that there's um, actually like no precedent, which maybe makes everybody take a big gulp because um, Maine doesn't have an open primaries function. It just has RCV in the general, which, um, uh, so we're, you know, like a step beyond that. And um, uh, I think there's like, at least for me, and this is why I supported a lot of reason to think it will create more representative and, and, and I think like more moderate outcomes. Um, but we'll find out, could be wrong, you know, could be right somewhere in between, we'll see. Um, I, I, and to the question, like, is it on people's minds? Uh, I think in part, I think it's really hard to internalize because it's such an abstract change and um still is like kind of like working through people's like neurons about just like what the implications are electorally and strategically um i i think i i feel like i have observed maybe some subtle and occasionally unsubtle shifts in political position based on uh people taking into account what who they are responsive to, given this change in the election system. Um, but that's just conjecture on my part that I've just like inner monologue. Um, and it, it could be wrong. I've never had a conversation about like, oh, because BM2 passed, I was going to do Y, but now I'm going to do X. Um, so I, and I, I guess I think like after we have one cycle and like we're able to take stock of what happened, I think then like then people will there will be a lot more decisive um sort of committed um reactions to to how that election system works and how um the results it generates um and i think to the other part of the question or sort of weaved in there about um you know leverage and california's dysfunctional budget process I'm sort of dimly aware of it. And I think Governor Schwarzenegger sort of ushered a suite of reforms, many by ballot initiative to try to change that from redistricting to a top two open primaries to a no budget, no pay provision um, to removing the supermajority passage of the budget. I mean, California hardly, you know, strikes me as a, a model of um, functioning representative democracy for a variety of reasons. Um, but those reforms seemed positive to me and sweet when they were passed you know, decade plus ago. Um, uh, I, I mean, I, I, I kind of feel like the sweep and the reverse sweep has, I mean, although maybe um, mitigated by the court decision somewhat, kind of has the potential of becoming um, like that own version of needing a supermajority to pass a budget. And um, I think it's like not a bad thing at all that there's a supermajority threshold to access CBR funds but the sweep and reverse sweep, I mentioned this briefly before, and I know Shelley's online and listening, and I said this in a floor speech, but um, using that as leverage, um, I just it just hurts people. It just breaks things. It's not a point of negotiation from my perspective. And Shelley and I had a great process. I really you know respect her perspe perspective, but that's something I just strongly disagree. And I was in the minority, and we just never imagined grabbing hold of that lever and using it, thinking we could use it as as leverage or to try to affect some kind of negotiation because it 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 just hurts people and breaks things. It does there's not like policy calories in it. Um, and and I see rep procs online and um, I mean probably heard me say this on the house floor. So um, I you know I think that's an unfortunate and I don't think anybody really wants to be using it. Um, we're just sort of in a unfortunate place politically where that happened um, and hopefully it can be undone. Um, but it, I mean, I think it says something that something like that is, is being, you know, used to uh, sort of in an effort to try to create an outcome. Um, you know, when five years ago, seven, eight years ago, that, um, yeah, again, like four years in the minority caucus, there was not one conversation that happened internally or casual hallway conversation about like, huh, 
what if we failed the reverse sweep? Like maybe we could, you know, get leverage or do X, Y, or Z. It just like did not occur to us because it just seemed like yeah, not a good idea. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I think that that's your point. And I, I, I would say that there, there may be limited tools in the toolbox and it is understandable to reach for that if if that's what the limited tool set is. Um, the, but the reality is, is that it those decisions are not just arcane procedural decisions within the legislature or the budgeting process. They, they do fall on individuals and in communities in Alaska. And, you know, again, I just would say, you know, I, 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 I trust the Alaskans that have been saying to us, you know, don't cut or, or what have you. Um, and um, so at, at any rate, um, I want to just uh, well, touch I, on I, wanted, I, I would just, I would just jump in. And I mean, I think like failing the CBR vote to access dollars out of the fund, you know, like I voted for the CBR access and I like fully understand. And I, I think there's like, you know, that's like such a valid point of leverage. Like that's the power the minority has to act to provide those CPR funds. And it's fully the prerogative to not provide those funds if they don't feel like there's a fair compromise on the table. Um, so, I mean, I think like that's a really fair lever, but the sweep is just like, what does it accomplish to like, and whammy what does it accomplish to end scholarships for you know you know that's the distinction let me i want to just pick up one uh, last question from the audience and then i'll turn back to cheryl um randy sweets online with us and uh, she references uh, some of uh senator hughes's uh, mentions of oil prices and productions as a key factor influencing uh, revenues and fiscal gap um, and her question is, is risk management associated with permanent fund earnings based on the stock market and other investment returns um, and the impact of those on revenue part of the conversation? And if so, what are the considerations? Um, so. Yes, yeah, so, sort of a, a variation on the fiscal stress right. question mm -hmm. and assumptions question. Yeah, I mean, it, it I think you just, you need to be sure to incorporate sort of black swan scenarios when you stress test any comprehensive plan, including on perm fund earnings. And I mean, we use the Calen 6.2% um, assumption. I think it's like kind of hard not to use it because that's <laughs> what the state pays a lot of money to get. And, um, you know, if you're just going to throw out another number like <laughs> why, why, you know, use some other arbitrary number over what the experts we pay are saying. Um, but like the one thing that I think we do have agency over is being clear eyed and sober about stress testing and, um, and, you know, like running the great recession through the model and seeing like what happens to your perm fund earnings and your, you know, POMV draw when you, when you run that scenario, um, for instance. So I, it's, it's really, really important. And it's really, really important as our revenue source becomes ever more um, sort of weighted towards prim fund earnings. So I, I fully concur on the importance, personally, at least. Well, um, in April, we do a program called Alaska Assets, where we look at the value of um, Alaska's assets and the returns on those assets. And uh, part of that conversation, we talked with the Mercatus Center and they um, discussed uh, Alaska's fiscal condition and, and where we stand relative to, to other states and um, uh, general uh, accounting guidance, government accounting guidance. But, uh, you know, the reality is, is that if you look at our budget in total, uh, with uh, about 60% of total funds coming from federal government, federal funds, and uh, then the balance uh, being predominantly permanent fund revenues, and then uh, some oil and other natural resource taxes. Uh, we have a, a pretty, um, it, it, it's, I, I think all of the the best minds in terms of fiscal modeling and financial risk uh, would look at that portfolio and say, um, 
you know, you do have fairly substantial risk that you have to take into consideration moving forward. And even some of our best tools, uh, theoretically, uh, converting the uh, permanent fund to a true endowment model and adhering to the PO and V, it has been the conventional wisdom that that's, those are the best choices moving forward. Um, yet most of the, the choices require, at least for a period of maybe three to five years, exceeding the POMB. And um, so in, in terms of saying that, that things are stress test and those things have been taken into consideration, and yet um, it, the, the, solu the near-term solution requires uh, overdrawing the POMB. Uh, I mean, I think Alaskans would be right not only to acknowledge that the legislature has sub has saved substantially, and that's why we at least have that revenue stream that we're relying on so heavily um, at this point. But a, a lot of the modeling moving forward is suggesting those uh, at least short-term overdraws. And why why should Alaskans say that that's a good bet to make? Yeah, and I should just flag, I'm going to have to jump immediately after this answer because I'm four minutes late to another, another thing. But um, uh, I mean, I think it, it's, a, it's a big policy question. Um, I mean, I uh, am uh, a hawk about um, the integrity of the permanent fund um, and the importance of managing it for intergenerational long-term value. Um, so, you know, I'm I'm open to a one-time overdraw if it's in the context of a comprehensive solution. Um, you know, like that's that's a concession I'm definitely willing to make um, if it you know comes with long-term responsible management of the fund. Um, and it's also worth noting that a one-time overdraw isn't necessarily you know the only way forward, and that also the stair-step model is another tool that can be used through for a transition period um, that uh, reduces or obviates the need for a one-time overdraw. Okay. All right. Well, um, we appreciate your time this morning. Um, Cheryl, I'm going to call you back in for final comments, but uh, uh, we understand you have to step away. And uh, thanks okay. so much. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks so much. Thanks yeah. for joining us. Yeah. Just, um, just for the benefit of this group, um, I just want to walk down memory lane for a minute, but in 1990, when the CBR was created, there was no PCE fund. There was no Whammy fund. There was no Alaska Scholars Fund. And those were all the product of the game that the legislature played to move things from unrestricted general funds to designated general funds. And DGF funded programs are the ones subject to the sweep. So for all this righteous indignation, um, they need to remind themselves that these are the results of what were political decisions, not necessarily policy decisions in moving these things to the designated general fund column. So I'm now off my soapbox and um, um, at least momentarily. And um, uh, so again, appreciate all of you joining us this morning. Um, so we don't have our next speaker scheduled yet. Uh, if you have any suggestions as to who you would like to hear from, please let Juanetta know or myself know, and, uh, uh, and we'll sift through um, and watch what the legislature is doing and decide what role we might uh, be able to, to help uh, play in advancing towards some, a solution. So with that, wish you all a great weekend. Mm -hmm.